We're joined today by the assistant head coach and running backs coach at UC Davis, Coach Mark Speckman. Coach, introduce yourself to our audience and uh, share your background in coaching. Okay. It's nice to be here. Uh, again, I'm Mark Speckman. I'm currently assistant head coach, as he said, at UC Davis. Um, I coached high school football for 17 years, I, 14 as a head coach, taught history, and thought that's what I was going to do forever. I really liked it. And um, had a chance to go become an offensive coordinator at a Division three school in uh, Oregon, uh, Willamette University. And that's where I started working with Dan Hawkins. And um, after three years, Dan went to Boise as an assistant, and I became the head coach at Willamette and did that for 14 years. Um, went to Menlo College for one year in California and um, had a chance to go rejoin Dan again in uh, Canada. And I was a running back coach for the Montreal Alouettes two years, and uh, I did two years as offensive coordinator at Lawrence University in Wisconsin after that, and then the last, this will be my fourth year at Davis. So I had two jobs in 25 years, and then the last decade, I, when the kids all grew up and moved out of the house, was able to um, move around a little bit and have some, some really neat experiences. And you've had a very unique story about your playing career as well, as you were born without any hands, but yet still went on to have a Hall of Fame career at Menlo College and, and also were an All-American Honorable Mention at Azusa Pacific. Tell us a little bit more about that journey you had during your playing career and, and how you overcame a seemingly detrimental condition to flourish in all that you did. Well, I like to joke that that, uh, that guy for the Seattle Seahawks, uh, Shamir Griffin, I think his name, uh, has one hand. I had no hands. Uh, and, and we're basically the exact same guy, except he's way bigger, faster, more athletic, violent, better. But, uh, you know, I never thought it was a huge deal. Um, but that, and, and I used to kind of just approach it that way, like, what, what's the big deal? And, but I've come to learn it kind of is a big deal. And um, I just, um, I had parents that made me do everything my brothers did. I was a middle child. Um, I was the youngest, I was the third youngest person in the United States ever get fitted for hooks. And I wore hooks all the way up to high school and, and I absolutely hated them. And, um, but that's kind of was my background. I wore hooks at school and, and uh, would take them off and go play. And football was just a great sport in the sense that, you know, if you had a high pain tolerance and um, didn't mind getting run over, it was a good sport for anybody. And, um, and I learned, you know, it was really interesting to me, what I've learned is how many kids in our classes or how many guys on our teams are listening to us and they're not listening to us. They're trying to figure it out in their own way. So, you know, for example, you know, coaches would teach us how to catch a pass, making a diamond with your fingers. And I'd be going, okay, that's not helping. And um, I'd be thinking the whole time, well, how am I gonna do that? And um, you know, or grab cloth when you tackle. And, uh, you know, I'm just going, well, that's not going to work. And I probably invented rugby tackling before there was such a thing as rugby tackling because that was the only way I, with my arms are a little bit shorter without the hands, obviously, then I'm pretty much right off at the wrist. Um, you know, I was the only way I could really get my arms around people. And, I think it made me a really good tackler because I had to have good feet and I had to get in front of people and I couldn't grab. So in some ways it was a really good, um, you know, good problem to have. I don't think there was ever a time, I was strong enough where I could kind of just grab somebody and, and um, you know, if I got a hold of you, usually you're going down. But, and I, you know, I could catch the ball fine. And I, you know, so, it was never really a huge issue. You know, I've got a smaller right foot. I only got four toes on that foot. That might've been a bigger problem or the fact that I couldn't play with my glasses on that made it so I was half blind. But, you know, football is such a great game that, um, you know, again, if you have some, some modicum of athleticism, quickness, you know, I, was, I thought I was a very quick player, very, very fast. Um, and, and so I was able to get places and, and get in the right spots. And I was, you know, pretty cerebral. And so there's a place for everybody in this, in this sport, especially in high school. And uh, obviously it gets, it weeds people out the higher levels you go. But um, I was just lucky that I got in this, you know, I had head coaches that I'm, 
I mean, I, as a head coach, kids would come in and they'd have a hearing aid or they'd have, you know, they'd have some issue. And I'd go, how the heck are they going to play? And I started thinking, well, what did they think when I walked in? You know, and they must have thought, you know, this is, a, you know, they're on candid camera or something. And, um, and so, you know, I'm really thankful to the junior college coach at Menlo. Um, you know, Ray Solari was a great influence. And my high school coaches were awesome. And, uh, always encouraged me and you know, told me I could play college football. And I had no idea I could. And, you know, I walked in in Azusa Pacific. And, and they, you know, great thing about football is after the, you know, the first hitting drills, it kind of weeds out, you know, doesn't matter what you wore preseason on the depth chart. You know, you have a chance every year to, you know, to move up. And so... It was a, a great confidence booster for me. It was a great way for me to integrate in my life. It was a great way for me to have to um, prove myself, you know, in a, in a way that everybody has to do. And, um, and I think anybody that's got a physical disability is really looking for some kind of opportunity like that somewhere along the line. And, and I don't know this the guy for the Seahawks, but I bet he's sick and tired of talking about it. Because I know when I was a player, I was sick and tired of talking about it. And I wanted people just to... Um, recognize me as as a really good football player and just as good as anybody else on the same level playing field and and um but i think as he gets older as i have i'm gonna you know you're gonna look back and realize why people would come up and introduce their kids to you after a game because they wanted their kids to see me doing something that they thought was incredible and it meant something to those kids, and, and it was a good lesson. And, and even though I didn't see it exactly that way, he's going to, you know, and I'm sure he's going to look back in time and see that he did totally incredible. Well, switching over to your coaching career a little bit, you know, one of the things um, that you spent a lot of time on is, you know, running back play, uh, coordinating offenses at various levels. How would you describe your offensive philosophy, and who were some of your mentors that helped you mold your philosophy? Well, I, I was a uh, I played linebacker at, at uh, Menlo and at Azusa Pacific, and I always thought. And, and my first few coaching jobs were as a defensive coordinator, and um, I really thought I was going to be a defensive coordinator. I love defense, and I I, I was all about it. And um, I had a chance. Um, I was working at a school called North Monterey County High School, in in. Um, down by Monterey, California. It's not, you think Monterey is really nice. We, this was Castroville, California, which is where the artichokes come from. And uh, we, it was a brand new school. And uh, I met Phil Moss and Roger Subamoto, and they came from uh, El Centro High School down in the desert of California. And they, we ran the Veer offense, and, but we had this fly package that they had picked up from a guy named Gene Beck, who was in Delano, California, and he did it in the late 80s, early 60s. And, um, and it was just four plays. It was four plays, one formation. And um, then after a year, I became a head coach at a, at a school, and I was all fired up about the defense, but I had no idea what to do on offense. So I, my, you know, my first thought was, let's just go, you know, play really good defense, punt, and then play really good defense. And that's not going to fly. You got to have some play. So I put the veer offense in with the fly, and I just found the fly was way more effective and easier to teach, and ball was on the ground less, and you didn't have a great quarterback. You could still survive. And so over the years, I just kind of clung to that four plays, and then it expanded to eight plays, and then the four formations, and eight formations, and and then just which is fun and open, you know, that I think when I was becoming a head coach, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't, uh, you really had to work hard to get film. You know, you had to really work hard to get cut-ups. And, uh, you know, today you got stuff like we're doing now. I mean, you could do football 24 hours a day sitting in your room. We have access to all the NFL film at Davis, all the college film. And I find that the younger coaches are watching film all the time getting ideas and I think that's great nothing wrong with that but I was always just kind of on a whiteboard or a chalkboard or whatever the heck we had kind of going what if we did this and it was like what if what if because I just go to these schools nobody really cared and we weren't very good and and so the fly kind of just was kind of a what if offense like well what if we ran it with no tight end what if we ran it to an unbalanced and what if we 
faked it and handed it to somebody else. And so I think, you know, and I, and I kind of go back to my life experience. I, I just wasn't afraid to, to try things, you know, I mean, I just always kind of looked at things differently and I was going, well, yeah, let's try it. And luckily there was nobody to tell me no, or, Hey, that's stupid. Or nobody else is doing it. And I'd look around, nobody else was doing it, but I was, you know, I was going as a defensive coach. I always thought that was a great advantage. If you had to prepare, I mean, as a defensive coach, I hated, I kind of put everything I hated into my offense because I didn't like motion and I didn't like um, unbalanced formation and I didn't like deception. I just like you to line up, announce where you're going, and then let's go mano y mano. And, um, and so I, I just felt like there's a lot of things that, that, that screw defenses up. And um, I tried to incorporate those ideas with that motion that I'd learned from uh, Phil and Roger. And and then over the you know again it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I, I had some great assistant coaches that really bought into it and, and they come up with ideas and and a lot of the ideas just started because kids screwed up you know kid lined up wrong or a kid went the wrong way and I'm going heck that's a great false key you know and, and that would become part of the offense and we would always joke about you know you know a kid making mistakes I'd always tell them hey, that's all right they're gonna draw a card up for that uh, waste some time and so. But philosophically, it was kind of like everything a defense shouldn't like, I tried to put in. And it really came from a defensive perspective. And that's a long answer, so sorry about that. Well, that's good. Um, so, Coach, if you had to, you know, describe the fly offense, I know you kind of described some of its tenets and the philosophy behind it. But if somebody in our listeners or who's watching this has never seen the fly motion, how would you describe the fly offense in a nutshell? Well, in a nutshell, it's, it's based around the fly sweep. And everything else is a counterpunch. And uh, it's, a, it's really a counterpunch offense. Um, all good offenses have a progression. And uh, so there is a progression to this. And, and I would always tell my team, and I still use this at Davis, hey, we're going to beat you with the sweep or we're going to beat you with the sweep. And, and what that means is if, you know, we can't run, if we can run the sweep, you're going to have a long day because we're going to be really good. We're going to be really good at it. And if you can't run this, if you do stop it, and we're going to beat you because you're stopping it and you're really weak somewhere else and we have a, a mechanism of, of, of attacking that and so to me it was it was a it just as a defensive guy trying to call plays i just wanted like so it would always be like, you know to me it was like okay i know you know this so now you know here's my counter punch and uh it was always like every clinic i ever talked at or anything i'd always say hey we're just we're going to run the sweep as many times as we can and i hope the defensive coordinators are playing are out there getting ready to stop it because they have to move pretty far to stop it and it opens up other things. So, and so first tenant is it's a, it's a, it's a perimeter office space on speed and timing. And then there's the deception part of it. To me, deception is the lost art of football. Um, you know, it works at any level. Okay. You know, I've seen, I, I've personally seen it work in the professional levels. It works at college, works in high school, Pop Warner, doesn't matter. Faking people out is, it works at all, any, everywhere. And I just felt, uh, you know, faking the sweep and then doing something else or giving the ball on the sweep and doing something else. So basically you were, there's usually going to be a sweep motion and then uh, either out of a one back or a two back offense or out of a behind center or shotgun. We've done it all those different ways. Whatever your style wants to be, you can add that. And um, but whatever plays you're running are you know are good. You can run a power with it. You can run. You can fake the sweep and run power. You can fake the sweep and run counter. You can fake the sweep and run inside zone. Whatever plays you love and can teach. I, you know, people that ask me, I always just tell them, hey, just just add the sweep and then put all your other plays in with the sweep fake, and then that's the fly offense. And, but as you study it, you're going to find that, that, you know, all the nuances that defenses have to stop it and then have an answer to, uh, to, to, uh, to go off of that. You know, when I coach against the option, we had plan A, and that was always good. And then plan B was, you know, you kind of – and if you had a plan C, that usually was good for a touchdown for the other team because kids could only learn plan A and maybe plan B. And plan C, somebody forgot the pitch or the dive or the quarterback. And so – most teams, when they play us, only have one way of, of stopping it or two. And, you know, if they try three, they usually get, get a little bit chaotic. And so, so basically, you know, just like any good offense, there should be some, some 
option principles of you know of, of having to stop the entire field and um you know a lot of people call it the jet and a lot of people call it the speed sweep um, but the whole offense revolves it i call it the fly because that's what i learned la mosca the fly and um you know if you really want to get my wife fired up you know, on tv just call it the jet or the speed sweep and she goes the reverse if she doesn't even know if a football's blowing up her stuff but she will get fired up about people calling the sweep the wrong thing did that answer that question for you yeah absolutely it does uh, coach now walk us through a day one install of the fly offense um okay. you know what are some of the play schemes you're installing if you want to take control of the screen um yeah you know, it's all yours coach okay um so getting back to why fly hopefully you guys can see this on the screen but one of the things that i hated as a defensive coach is when we only had one week to prepare for a style uh kids like it when we're playing you know Hey, this team runs a, a spread offense, and they're, they're dangerous, but it's just like the last one, and it's just like the last one. And obviously, there's different things you have to prepare for, but the structure is the same. And the other thing I like, it's a team-oriented offense. Even stars must fake. I thought it built character. Um, and so I used to tell my guys, well, you know, like, well, Lamb, it, you know, how would you like to – average 100 yards a game and they'd always say that's great and i said you care if it's 10 carries or 30 and they'd think about it and go well 10 would be all right and, and um and so we were we, we want to be explosive and um if we do our deal we're going to be we're going to hit big plays i think you have to have a offense has to have a progression again i said deception is the lost art of football i loved having an image you know i'm the idea that when we came in we were the fly team and i you know in the book, Good to Great, they talk about trying to be the best at something in the nation. And we thought we could be the best deceptive team in the nation. We thought we could run the fly sweep better than anybody else in the nation. And our kids really believed that. And so I like the image we created. Uh, we didn't really teach plays per se. We really taught concepts. So basically the line learned rules, the backs learned paths, and the receivers had concepts. But sometimes the line would have a little bit more in than the receivers or the receivers have a little bit more in. But I always kind of thought that offenses should be like Lego building blocks that you can kind of, you have five or six different pieces and they're all different and you can put them together and make anything. And that's kind of how I look at, at offense is, is having, you know, the line maybe a little bit different with the rules and the backs having pads. That's what we came up with and the receivers having concepts. So I can go into that a little bit more. Then the sweep is the best play in football. I don't know if it is or not, but we say it is. Fastest, stretches the defense, and there's a lot of ways that you can run the, run the sweep. And so um, I think any good offense, you know, you want to eliminate turnovers. That's one of the reasons I got away from the veer. Um, I, I just couldn't coach it well enough, so a lot of people can. Um, you want to eliminate sacks and protect your quarterback. You want to be balanced, balanced into the, with the field and running pass. You know, as a defensive coach, you're always talking about swarming to the ball or everybody, every hat to the ball. And good offenses don't let you do that. Uh, they're going to make you go one-on-one -on -one somewhere, and we should win some of those. So I want my, I, my idea with the fly offense was stop the swarm. Don't let them uh, all run to us. Uh, make them play us like the option. Get the ball into space. Four points against any defensive scheme. So many coaches, you know, when I first started out would say, oh, I hate going against that defense. Oh, man, we got a long day ahead of us. Or, oh, man, we can't do, you know, certain schemes would bother you. And I, I never wanted that to happen. And my whole goal was to make, because I know as a defensive coach, you don't want to be vanilla. But if you make them play base or check base, we thought we had the advantage. Um, so philosophically, even a dead man can fake. Um, you know, I talk about the move. There, there was the French Foreign Legion propping dead guys up on the on the walls, and, and the uh, Arabs thought there was too many soldiers to attack. So even a dead man can fake, and I have a movie to prove that. Uh, it's difficult to key one player. I think it's difficult to simulate in practice. Within there, you know, I would sell our team that there's nobody going to run it as well in practice as they're going to see it game day. Uh, logical progression, you must stop the sweep. Simplicity within complexity is, is the hallmark of any good football program, in my opinion. And then have some fun with it. We love faking guys out. We, we make a big deal about it. Uh, 
guys really, you know, make it a fun deal to uh, be deceptive. One of the so getting into let's get into the sweep here real quick. Um, one of the things that that we did is is we number our perimeter from the outside in. There's nothing new. I stole this from a clinic, and I don't know who the guy was, but I never heard of it. But the outside, we call, we we know uh, number the corner number one, uh, the outside force player number two, uh, the inside linebacker number three, and the safety number four. So if he's one high, he's number four. If it's too high, it's the nearest safety. And so the the um, on most of our and all of our blocking schemes, we have a we we tell them who to block. So, for example, if I called this a a, a one forty two, he gets the first digit, he gets the second digit, and he gets the third digit. We could go two twenty one. That was a base way that we like to do it. We could go four twenty one, and whenever we have that scheme, we would read this block. If this guy runs out, he would come inside and block. So on that one, it was a read. And I'm just giving you just ideas, you know. There, there's just one wide receiver. You could block at one, two, which is not my favorite way to do it, but you can. Or you can block at two, one. And, um, and so I think one of the things that people do when they try to run the sweep is they kind of just block. They try to make it real simple. And there's nothing wrong with that, except this is a long block. And so I, I prefer him not to block him if we can help it. But sometimes we can run them off. Sometimes we're good enough to block them if they have the right guy. And so this numbering thing has been really good. So the corner to the call side, level two defender, call side linebacker, and then the level three safety. Um, and then real quick, I don't want to go into the whole line thing, but you asked about day one install. On day one, we would teach track blocking, and that's what we call the track. I do not believe in pulling the guards um, on the fly sweep. I've, I've seen a lot of people do it, and I've seen very, very, very few meaningful blocks. Every now and then you get, might have a 150-pound guard in high school, and he might be quick enough to get outside, and he might make an actual block. But most of the time they're playing guard because they're guards, and the philosophy of the fly sweep is you should not have to block a three technique and you should be able to get outside. And so we would always try to get linebackers. Now, this is just day one. There's a, you know, at Davis, we were doing it. Uh, some, some times we'll, we'll do this, but a lot of times we're just running our zone stuff away from it and, or to it, or we're pulling a guard. You can block any way you want in, in your scheme. You just have to come up with the way of calling it. And, and we mastered that, and we have mastered it. But... You know, I, I'd rather this guy let these guys run a little bit, especially the bigger they are, the more I like them to run because they become very ineffective in the third and fourth quarter. And we're really trying to get up and pick it, pick off a linebacker. And if there's some kind of a fake in here and this linebacker steps up, we got a chance. And um, we tell our, our linemen, linebackers are like buses. If you miss one, there's always another one coming. And if, if I can't get this guy, he's gone, I'm going to get this guy. And if he's gone, I'm going to get this guy. And if he's gone, some ED's running. And so, I, you know, I'm not going to go into a whole lot more on, on the old line, but um, I just think that pulling guards, if, I just watch a lot of film where they're usually behind the sweeper, and the sweeper, when he makes a cut, has to dodge his own guy and guys on defense. So I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, are we good with that, Coach? Yep, we're good with that. And then while I got the PowerPoint on, let's just keep going. Uh, I think one of the things was our the way I prepare um, game plan wise, and this would be install wise also, is I, when, I, when I scout you, I'm going to look at how do you line up to uh, this edge, which is just a tight end. So it could be trips, it could be two back, it could be double tight, but Everybody's going to line up to that look, and they don't have a whole lot of variety. They're, most defenses are just going to give you two, maybe three ways. And we're going to find out which is the most effective sweep. And, um, and our sweeps 
are like a stoplight. Uh, we have a green light sweep, we have a yellow light sweep, and we have a red light sweep. And I can go into big time detail on that if you want, but green means we're trying to get outside, we're going outside unless we can. And yellow means we're gonna read it, and red means we're gonna cut it up. And, um, and so I would check off the ones I like after I watch film, and I would query it in my, in my uh, once we got the computers, but even before, when we just shoot, we just we used to do it on Manila folders, I would find I would find all the plays that had just a tight end, and I'd find out how you lined up to it. And uh, there was a difference if you lined up if it was to the field or to the boundary. Um, and then the next edge I would look at would be just one wide receiver. And obviously, there's not as many blockers, so you don't have as many ways of running the sweep. Um, and then I would come up with, hey, I like that. That's a good way. Or man, that's you know, it's, there's too many problems, or it's too much teaching, or too many what ifs, so let's just, because there's plenty of edges. Then the next one I would go to would be edge three, like what, you know, again, we got a lot of red, and there's a lot of blockers here, and so the more blockers there are, the more ways we have of running it, and these are just ways that I've run in the past, and and um, some of them we've only run once or twice, just against certain teams, but I would kind of, as we added them, I'd put them on the, the, the check sheet, and over the years, I've kind of come up with unbalanced edges. So I have an edge five and an edge six, and we have an edge zero where you just run to the to the nub of an unbalanced. So you put everybody, you know, put everybody unbalanced away from here, and that's just guard tackle, and then we run the sweep to that. So my my goal was to run, you know, find the best sweeps we can run, and and attack you with those, knowing what the counter punches were going to be. So last thing on this. This PowerPoint I want to show you is just we really try to have as many you know, people say, well, what is a fly offense? And, and this could be right side, left side. I was a strong side, quick side coach. I think that's a good way to do it. Um, but there's a lot of ways to do it. But if you don't know, flip flop your guys, you can just, this could be the field side or right side. This could be boundary or left, however you do it. But we would try to have plays that would hit everywhere and that looks like a lot of offense but all these plays are um mirrored and so if we wanted to run a um you know if we wanted to run a belly well the ice was the was the counter play to it it's the same play and so the line only had to learn six or seven things the backs only had to learn certain paths and then the receivers only had to learn certain concepts. So we could kind of easily, this wasn't as much as, as it looks. And again, that's, that's, that's clinic talk, right? I mean, you got to figure it out. But I didn't want to have the motion going, the motions going from left to right. I did not, I wanted to have a play that hit, at least one play that hit every area. And, and over the years, we've, we've developed quite a few. And this can be from behind center or shotgun. And it can be, um, you know, it can be one back, two back, no back, however you want to do that. So, Coach, we ready to move on to some film? Yes, sir. All right. Make sure this all works. So, I, I gave a talk earlier um, this quarantine. Uh, about fly sweep. So this will be some of the stuff I talked about, but um, I think the key to running the sweep is the edges I just talked about. I think the timing of the um, the mesh, I call it the mesh, the, the timing between the quarterback and the sweeper, uh, the perimeter blocking, which I touched on already, uh, the interior blocking, which I touched on, uh, the stoplight system, which I touched on, I'll show you that on film. And then the counter punches. How do you accommodate the rotations, the reads, the adjustments, and then the different shifts and, and motions that you can add to it. And so just real quick, this is how I learned it. I didn't invent the fly sweep, but this is Delano High School, circa 1959 or something. But you can see... This guy here is in a three-point stance, cocked in, and everybody's in a track stance, behind center. Um, obviously, the X's and O's today are way different, but these are still X's and O's. And, and 
And this guy gets up, goes in motion to hand him the ball. They pull the guard. The guard stands there like a traffic cop and a bad. Let me let me do something here real quick, Coach. Make sure this is in the best quality. So again, that's why we don't pull guards. And, um, good play. Here it is again. It's, somebody's faking. So just a. Uh, the whole um, kind of the philosophy, you know, they don't know where the ball is. The ball's getting outside. Looks a lot like the wing tee. This guy was a wing tee coach. <clears throat> and um, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz after black and white becomes color. There's a lot of unintended consequences. And this is us at Davis playing. And, and um, we're a big shotgun team. But you watch this, cor this corner chasing our guy and this Mike Backer, you know, they, they these are things you just don't practice and practice, you know, you know, because it doesn't happen that way. And so they kind of collide right there. And obviously we're going to get the ball. What they take out one of our, one of the guys, we might've scored anyway, but mo all that stuff just is another layer of problems for the defense, in my opinion. And um, this happens all the time over the years. Just, you know, again, just some, um, uh, simple for us, complex for them. And, um, Behind the center mesh, again, there's a lot of riding here, but let's just keep it, we don't have much time. The approach is how fast does this guy run from here to here? And basically, I tell them to build their speed. You want to build it kind of like you're water skiing or, you know, you're in a bad neighborhood and you got to run from somebody. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can go a little bit faster, but you're going to build your speed and you're aiming one yard behind the quarterback one yard behind the quarterback. So that's, you're aiming, you're approaching, you're building your speed, and it's the quarterback's responsibility to time this. It's critical. Because if I'm trying to time it and he's trying to time it, it's not going to work. Uh, I'm going to be hesitant. I tell the sweepers, if you run by and he, you don't get the ball, you should be thinking, man, Coach Beckman's going to be mad at the quarterback because he sure screwed up. And then the second thing is the mesh. That's why the quarterback is going to take what we call a fly step He's going to try to get one yard behind the center with his back to the defense. Uh, a lot of teams in the NFL, they don't get that guy, the quarterback, all the way around, which is that's fine too. But they do a pretty good job of at least hiding the football. And then <clears throat> we, we call this a slide step. So it's like, like you're running to first base. You're going to round first and go to second. You don't just run to first and take a 90-degree cut to second base. So a slide step is just one body width. And um, you know, so if you're right here, you move one body width away, you just push off your inside foot. And um, <clears throat> then we talk about slide and hide. I mean, when you slide, we try to hide the football. Now I make my guys do this in practice. And uh, when they fake, they grab their jersey. But to the defense, it should look like they should not see the ball. Now you, can, you don't have to do this. And some guys, this guy just got really comfortable with it. He got really good at it. And, um, but we want them to think about getting that football, sliding and hiding. And again, if he keeps it up in his armpit, and that's fine too. But you got to make sure you fake it. Don't run the pump in this arm because you don't, that's not what it looks like when you have a football. Um, and then you're, you're going to try to catch the lead back and be on the outside hip of the lead back. So that we call that the catch. And then set up the block, either fake in and go out or fake out and go in. So that's the, the mechanism that we, we talk about is the approach, the mesh, slide and hide, catch the back, set up the block. And um, this is a good picture of the catch position. His inside arm is on his outside hip. We talk about being like the Thunderbirds or the, or the Blue Angels. You want to be wingtip to wingtip coming around the corner <clears throat> because. A lot of times, when I first started, the back would be so far ahead, he'd make, miss the block, or the defense would dodge him, and they'd come back in and make the tackle. And I don't want him, I don't want the defense to be able to do that. And so that's that. And this is a common mistake. You can see he should be on the outside of this fella, or this guy. But he sees green grass. I call that fool's gold. And so he's trying to cut up, and this happens all the time. You just got to work with your guys. He cuts up way too early. And um, you can see his eyes are looking right. He's not looking out here. 
and this is the same game, same players, this is correct. You want to be on the outside because if you cut up too early, that that gap is you know, it's like it's like a tackling drill. You know, you're putting two bags out there and they're pretty close together. And the whole idea is to put the bags far apart as you want, and then the defense offense has a good chance of winning and the defense has a good chance of losing. But right now we talk about wait until the pads collide before you make your cut. And if you, again this guy's we're always aiming for the outside shoulder. If you can't get it, if the guy's running so hard, just just take him the way he wants to go, and then we'll cut off of you. We want to stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. And um, it, this is a much better look right here. All right. All right. What am I doing? All right. Again, any backfield set works. I think I, I think the straight eye is the one that probably doesn't work as well, although I've had guys quick enough from Pisco to get there. I prefer the offset, offsetting the back, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, went over that, went over that. So, so this is um, a mesh drill, we call it. I'll just show a couple of these. I, I like to film it on a line so I can see how deep the quarterback gets. Uh, and then the slide step should take him to about four yards. That's a good look right there. So the quarterback sees it, times it, and then he's faking something. Okay. Then this is another good way to, to film it. Um, another good way – have a manager, have somebody snapping the ball because if he's, the quarterback is holding it, or if you just have, you don't have a lot of guys, quarterback has to drop the ball and catch it. If he's holding it, drop it, catch it, because otherwise, screws the timing up. And uh, quarterback's timing this, five step, and we're just working on, here's another school, we got a bunch of guys going at the same time, different, K, every, every, coach, all the quarterbacks are on their own cadence, you have coaches snapping the ball here, you've got the, um, ubiquitous ball in the way for somebody to break their ankle on but everybody's working just the mesh the timing and again you can see them all hiding the ball get that ball out of the way now we add the back and just something i learned with the back when we first started i just had the back take off and everything was everything was outside and so he just took off we never really had a good angle other than to kick him out. And then this guy would slide step and the, and the apex between these two, I don't even know if that's an apex, whatever the hell that is, was too big. And so we've taught our guy to take what we call a J step. He steps at two o'clock here, 10 o'clock the other way, three steps, and he makes the letter J. So that has worked out way better and we can catch him. And that's what we're trying to do here. He's got a J step. Uh, you can do it from a two point stance, three point stance. That doesn't matter. I don't know what we're doing here. But that's good. Look at the drill. That's kind of our behind center. Uh, this one is a good look. We, put, we made them stretch it just to get them in the habit of stretching it. We put them way out wide. And we told this corner either come inside or don't, get, don't let them leverage you, don't let them get outside. And then don't don't make a cut until the pads collide. And uh, so then we evolved to the shotgun. And uh, there's a reason, you know, everybody was, you know, we started because of two-minute offense. We had a short quarterback. And then third and long, we're going, who's kidding who? we got to throw the ball. And then my thought was, can we time the sweep and do the back pads? And I wanted it to be just like behind center. And at first, we could not time it. And the reason we could not time it was because I was using the same mechanism as behind center. And to me, if you want to time it in the shotgun, we have this guy time the snap. Now he's still in charge of the cadence, but he can't look at the secondary, catch the ball, and time this. And you see a lot of bad timing in the shotgun. And so to me, I we tell our guy, build your speed. And then when you see that ball, you either accelerate or you're going to, um, you know, kind of keep, keep it slow. Because there's always a low and left, high and right. It's not, shotgun snap screws up a lot of plays. And so by making it the sweeper's responsibility, we were able to have those bad snaps and, um, and still survive. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So now 
the sweeper is looking at the, we call him the sweeper, is looking at the football, and he speeds up when he sees that snap. It's going to be a good snap, and, he, and it should be boom, boom. That's good timing right there. That quarterback standing there waiting, that's bad. And um, so all the quarterback is doing right now is kind of starting the motion. Then he, he you know, out of the, you know, out of where the tackle is. And again, I don't. I used to overcoach that a lot. Just go get the hang of it. Just let him get some reps at it. Out the tackle, I tell him snap it, and then that sweeper <clears throat> will be there. The other thing on this is don't slide step. They're already deep. So you, we don't slide step up in the gun. This is the wildcat, and this is how you can give, if your quarterback can run, or you want to put a tailback in a quarterback. This is where a lot of teams are using their wildcat stuff. A lot of teams, this is just their base offense. That's kind of how we are at Davis. Little that, that one, I think the quarterback is waiting a little bit long, but it's, yeah, it's close. You can see he's kind of building his speed, building his speed, timing it. I think that's critical. All right, build your speed, build your speed, build your speed, go. That's good right there. Watching the football. And then this I think is really important. Like, don't always make the snap perfect. Here, this is the perfect snap. Guy, this is the first day we did it, so he's just used to slide step and the kid's doing a good job trying to hide the ball, timing it. But watch the coach here. I've asked him, don't be. now here it's high and high into the right, to the left. And again, we still get a good mesh. Quarterback had to time it and get his eyes on the ball. I think we'd have a problem. And here, here the coach does a good job of low. Don't always make it perfect. Nice job. And then let's just put it all together here real quick, and then coach, we can have some questions maybe, or right, we can move on to something else. But this is a bad snap, and we get a good play, and so. Let's go back to our numbering. This is going to be a green light sweep. We're going to try and get outside, although we know against this team we probably aren't going to get outside. And um, the thing I like about the fly offense is we can have two plays in one. And so I'll, we're going to block. We're going to block trap. We're going to pull the left guard. He's going to trap this guy. We're going to block everybody like it's a trap. Quarterback's going to fake. Crap, he knows that. We're going to hand the ball off on the sweep. These guys are all got numbers, so they know where to go. So this guy's going to go to two. So he's number one. He's number two. He's number three. And he's number four. And so our guys, we practice this. They know. I, we just went out to practice, and I just said point to two. He'd point to him. If I said point to uh, four, he would point to him. If I said point to one, he would point to him. And they now they know who to get. All right. And again, we're not going to do it because you never get everybody you're supposed to block, but we got a fighting chance. And the quarterback knows because of the way we called it, and the line knows we told the line block trap. You fake the quarterback trap. You guys are blocking a green light sweep. You're blocking a green light sweep. We told everybody what to do. They don't really know what a green light sweep is. They know it's going outside, but they don't care because they're blocking something different. So let's just watch uh, the let's watch a blocking feed first. Well, first of all, let's watch a snap because it's a bad snap. The ball is actually on the ground, and we still get the ball up and to the sweeper. And if we get number four, we got a chance. It's still a good play. So let's go back and watch. The blocking scheme. We get a good crack on number two. Most of our green light sweeps, we like to crack block. We kick out number one. And, you know, again, that's a tough block. Sweeper could have helped them by setting it up. This is a better way to look at it. And again, this team is a guard reading team. They're not, they don't like looking at all this stuff in the backfield. So they're not going to get fooled by the backs. So we're going to fool them with the line. So that number three, the linebacker goes with the trap. But what I really like about this clip is the ball is actually on the ground almost. It should be. 
And the quarterback just catches it and puts it in front of him, and that sweeper timed it because he could see. And again, let me know if the film's not good, Coach. But he can see. You can see his eyes are right on the football. And I just, you know, even when you don't have motion, shotgun snaps can cause uh, problems. And so this, to me, uh, is just a good example of the shotgun snap. Uh, this guy should have – sweeper probably could have helped him. He thinks the sweeper's on his outside. That's why he went there. If the sweeper had maybe dipped in and gone out, he might you know, still be running. So that's, um, that's that. So – Coach, should we shift gears here? Yeah, if you want to shift to more of your, you know, shift package, you know, that'd be great if you have some stuff on that. Yeah, let me, let me, uh, shifting is we want to move the defense prior to the snap. Um, a lot of times you're asking your quarterback to read, but the ball snapped and then he has to read. Where if there's somebody going in motion or there's a shift, you get a pre the ball. The quarterback can watch and go, okay, I see it. And he gets a little couple more seconds. The other thing I like about moving uh, the motion and the shifting, I remember being a young coach and, and a, being at a clinic with a big D1 coach was talking, and he made something. That, he said something that really struck me from a because as a defensive coach, he was absolutely right. Is eight seconds? This is when everybody used to, but eight seconds from when the huddle breaks to when the ball snapped. That belongs to the offense. You can shift. You can motion. You can do whatever you want to screw the defense up. And if you don't, according to this coach, you were really playing into the defense's hand. And I always thought as a defensive coordinator, if they just break the huddle and we got eight seconds to kind of figure out where the trips are, where the best player is, you know, what the tech tendencies are. I mean, I've had, you know, you, you know we, we've had defenses calling out tendencies that, in that eight seconds. And to have to, for them to keep thinking and, and moving gives us the advantage. So moving the defense is, is number one. Being able to disguise your formations is, is big. You know, a lot of teams are boundary field um, or tight end, no tight end. Uh, they're going to flip sides. And so when you get up and move, they either have, they have to make a decision. They have to practice it. Simple, but it does take time. Uh, you, can gain, uh, you can gain position on a defense, especially if you want to block down on them or, or get the edge. Uh, you can Sometimes they don't move enough. Displace the defense, gain numbers at the point of attack, and then you can declare man coverage, um, and then beat it with your, you know, or you can, you can also uh, see the slants and see the blitzes. So, for example, when we start our motion, uh, um, you know, a lot of times we'll give a, a hard count and the defense will flinch and they show exactly where they're going. You know, so teams that, um, Teams that want to slant a lot, we would always try to do some kind of a shift or motion and go past the quarterback and because they would usually think it was fly. I'll show you this. And they would, you know, they would anticipate and they would lean. And if you're an offensive lineman, you know they're slanting to your, you know, inside or outside. That makes your job way easier than trying to figure it out at the snap of the ball. So anytime they want, you know, I thought, I thought the defenses would declare way earlier. Uh, just a lot of good things. And so you got to come up with a way of, of um, you know, so in the fly offense, we had to take advantage of anything away from motion. So, um, and I would look at the, I'll show you this, but I'd look at their linebacker alignment. I'd look at how the defense moved with motion and I would use their pursuit against them. Um, and so basically there's, you know, in the simplest terms, they're either going to run with you with, they're either going to run with your motion or they're not going to run with you. And, uh, and then we had a plan for both of those. Um, real quick, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I was really big on labeling the defense. And, um, and so we would, you know, because you always told people, well, there's a million names for this guy, Force Defender, Nickel, Sam, Bob, Ted, Eric, uh, you know, Triangle Player. And so we try to make it real, real uniform. That on, to our tight end side, that was the Sam, and then the Mike backer was in here. And if they had a, a, a bandit, we called them. I'm just using my terminology. And uh, and then a Will linebacker, and um, and this was very. So here you would see that that would be a Sam, the Mike, the bandit, and the Will. 
it's like down here, there is no will because they're playing some kind of a shell coverage. And so if they're going to rotate. They're going to have to rotate with their secondary, but they're, they're kind of weak here. Now we're kind of weak here, but again, we can sweep this way and get, we can get numbers. And so here they don't have a bandit. They just have a will, a Mike and a Sam. And so we were really big on identifying where those linebackers were going to play. And so I just, I just think this is a good idea, you know, whether you're on the fly or not, just, just to help your kids um, identify these guys. And we're all talking the same language. Um, and then when we went in motion, we would try to see how many linebackers did you, I call this area the hole. This is just, I, this is just me making stuff up. But if you left two guys here, then we weren't running here. We were going to run here, or we were going to run outside, or we were going to throw the ball, or we were going to do something, but we weren't running here. Unless we could gain an advantage somehow, we'd have to add a blocker. Or if you, this was your base way of doing it, we would put a tight end over here, and then we felt like, okay, now we can run away from our motion. Um, if we went in motion and they moved, and there was only one in a hole, then we really felt like we could run backside, we could zone it back here, we could trap it back here. We had a good chance uh, of, of, of getting a big play here. And, uh, and so that was kind of how we looked at using the motion with the fly stuff was how many, what are you doing? Are you leaving all your linebackers over here or are you going to move them out? Again, if they left them here, we'd add a tight end and feel pretty good about running this way and take the tight end from, from this side and move them over. Um, but it was just a way of, you know, everybody's counting the box. I, you know, this was just how you counted the box in my world before you knew what counting the box was. And, um, and then types of motion, I think this is kind of important. When I first started out, we just did fly motion. That's it, or no motion. And then, uh, and then it was either fly motion or fake fly. So we fake the fly sweep and hand off to somebody else. Then as we got into it, we started changing the motion a little bit. So we bring him into the tackle, and I have, I have pictures of this. Um, and we start bringing him in, bring him back out. Uh, we'd have him come across the ball. We'd have him come from the backfield, and then uh, return motion. And so, again, it sounds like a lot, and you just got to kind of play around with your terminology. But this would be fly motion or fake fly motion. and um, so he, you know, if I called, let's just say I wanted to run an ISO out of two back, I would call ISO out of two back. And in, in our world, he would just naturally go in motion unless we told him not to. So that cut down to having to call it all the time. Um, but, you know, if you just, you know, we have, you, you could have a turn for when he's getting the ball in the sweep and a turn for when he's going to fake. And um, but for the defense, it would look exactly the same. And then team started. You know, when I was coaching in high school, teams started timing the motion. And, and um, you know, I would always talk to defensive coordinators from schools that were leaving or I was leaving in high school. Um, I'd go talk to the guys I thought defended us the best. And I'd ask them about our tendencies. And I'd ask them about what they did and how they practiced. And, and one guy just kept he said, hey, every time that ball you go in motion, you're snapping the ball right here. And that's true. And so we had a a return motion and I'll never forget the first time we did it they blitzed and blew up our quarterback and it was a fight and the penalty and the fans were going crazy and I and I'm thinking the whole time that's pretty cool it worked and um and so that is a good way to that's another way of running motion uh coming all the way across is, is we do this quite a bit you can still run your ISO you can run your pass plays uh you know I know at Davis we like to do this and kind of like arena league and get our receivers into it a good way if you have a really good receiver that they can't double team them and just bring them across we always try to make our motion look like fly to here and then he can do whatever he wants to here and i always had him there's there's a receiver out here he just keep running sideways and watch the receiver and go when the receiver goes if there's no receiver he would kind of hop and you've seen that on, on tv um you know come bring him in and Come out, it's a good way to do it. Bring them in, crack, or bring them in and run a route. But again, as soon as we started going in motion, they started started um, rotating. And um, 
and then motioning from the backfield. I've done it where we've we've had this guy actually um you know, kind of come out here, come here, and then come back, get a little head of steam and, and run the sweep that way or fake the sweep that way. Um so these are just ideas that again, as many ways as you can think of, just and again, you don't have to do them all every game, but we had reasons for doing them and we would do a couple every game. We always did the fly stuff. Um, and then two, you know, two more points I'll make, you know, um, I read somewhere that, you know, Eskimos have like 27 words for snow and, um, anything that's important in your culture, you have a lot of words for So like, you know, we have a lot of words for money in our culture, moolah, cash, green, Benjamins, you name it. We got a ton. And for us, we had a lot of rotation in the secondary was really important in our culture we had a lot of words so we had a cloud coverage which is pretty fun. and we had a suicide where they're both coming up and this would be people up in this up in the press box saying coach it's a suicide role we got fly motion coming or some kind of motion coming into the ball and they're both coming up we got to have some kind of sweet pass we got to have something to take advantage of. cannot let people suicide roll you i and the reason i know that is because i've let people suicide roll me and we lost sky coverage was where they're trying to force with the safety a runner where they're coming and running with you um and so these were all things that we just kind of would talk about and have a plan for now all the blocking schemes still cover this that i talked about but you would really want to you know practice against these and make sure um so for example, if you were going 221 here and they're in the, in, the, in the cloud and the safety's playing deep, we probably would not, you know, we would probably double team number two. And then if we came off, we come off to number three. And if they were, you know, if they were uh, bringing the safety down, then we would probably double team number two and come off to the safety. So those are the little nuances that we got into um, on, our, on our sweet plays. And then there's a you know Sam bounce, no rotation, Mike bounce. These are all things that we saw over the years. Um, everybody bounce, all the linebackers bounce over, which leaves one in the hole. Um, and so just having a way of identifying. Then I use, I put this on just you know a little little humor, but hell sometimes I don't know what the hell they're doing and they're going everywhere. And so we uh, we would say hey I don't know. That didn't happen very often, but every now and then they screw up and do it. And then if there was four DBs, you know, we had cloud high, we had sky high, we had sky low. A lot of teams would do this to try to stop our run game. Uh, cloud low. Um, we played Chapman University down in Orange County, and they're the first team to do it to us. I still call this a Chapman uh, rotation, where they brought this safety and he became number four. So we had to change our count here. Uh, that was a really, I thought a really good, interesting way of doing it. Obviously they're leaving themselves a little weak on some things. No rotation, sky high, runner, sky low, and bounce. Again, it can keep going on and on, blah, blah, blah. We don't know what the hell they're doing. But this, all those things made sense to us. And if you're gonna be a motion offense, I really think you got to have some terminology and some understanding of what teams are going to do to you, whether they're a one high secondary or a two high secondary. Um, and it really is the same thing with shifting. The whole idea on things with sh shifting, um, the good thing about shifting is it makes the defense move. The bad thing about shifting is you guys don't have very long to recognize what they just got into. We try to keep all of our shifting plays where we would do gap schemes. And um, I know Matt Canada, you know, has been really famous for um, you know, taking two tight ends, a tight end and a wing, and shifting them. And, and, and uh, when he was at, um, well, everywhere, but especially at Pitt and LSU um, and at Maryland. And I had a lot of success with it. But most of the time, they're doing some kind of a green light switch of the two and the tackle know where they're or the tight end and the uh, wing know where they're going and then the line's blocking some kind of zone or, or power and so 
to me, the shifts are just the same as the motions. Um, I just think you should have a mechanism to do all of it. And um, you may not have a too tight end, so why are you even messing with it, right? And so maybe maybe you take your tight, your running back, and you put him out, and then you bring him back into the backfield. Uh, or sometimes you give him the ball in the fly sweep. Or um, so we we have. Uh, I know you know we try to have as many ways as possible, and we're not going to do them all every day. We're not going to do them all every game. But in our playbook, we have all this stuff written down, and we can kind of re- you know, go back and this week let's do this. And if you make it bite size, I think you can you can. Um, really help your team. The other thing I think it does is if you're a defensive coordinator, you're writing all this stuff down. And if you get, if you do something different the next week and you know you're going to do something different, they've just practiced, you know, shift A that you did. And then if you go to shift B, um, you know, they're, they're back on the whiteboard on the sideline and they're usually not as good doing that. So 